Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brian Johnson. I'm the president of MassMedic, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another MassMedic Insiders webinar series, MedTech M&A from the financial buyer's perspective. This is a, a really great, rare chance to hear from some of the PE firms that are in, involved in this industry every day. We're pleased to present this content to you today with the support of our partners from MedWorld Advisors. MedWorld Advisors is a boutique mergers and acquisitions firm that specializes in helping small to medium-sized businesses in medtech, biotech, dental, life sciences, digital health, and much more in healthcare to reach their goals. They're based in Massachusetts, while their team of advisory experts is global. MedWorld was recently named number six on the Axial's top 20 lower middle market investment banks. So we're really pleased to be working with them today on this program. So during this webinar, we're gonna be discussing M&A in med tech from the perspective of the buyer. And our panel is gonna be hosted by Daniel Shepard. He's the managing director for middle markets at MedWorld Advisors. He'll be joined by Mike Magliocetti from Riverside Partners where he's the operating partner, Steve Sambo, principal from Vance Street, and Eric Tansky, the general partner from Excel Med Partners. Just a quick housekeeping note before I hand over the reins to Daniel. This meeting is being recorded and a link to view the recording will be sent out to everyone who registered for our webinar today. We also will have a chance for you to ask questions. Um, if you want to, you can submit them through the Q&A tab on your control panel. And with that, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Daniel and take us away for a great conversation. All right, thank you, Brian, and, and thanks to Mass Medic for helping to uh, support and, and host this event. Also, uh, thank you to the panelists for joining. I will say a special thanks to, to Eric for, for accommodating his schedule to uh, have this fit in last minute as we had to switch up a panelist that, that couldn't make it. So I really appreciate everybody joining and really appreciate the audience for, uh, for, for, for uh, attending this webinar today. I think whether you are a, a business owner that could potentially uh, have your business acquired by a private equity firm, whether you work for a company that has been acquired by a private equity firm or whether that's something down the road or whether you're just in the med tech in general, I hope this is an informative session for you. Um, but before we jump, jump into the main questions, I just kind of want to start with each of the three of you kind of giving an overview of, of your firm and, and kind of the elevator pitch on, on, on how you view the market. So, you know, maybe, maybe Eric, as a special thanks to jump it in last minute, I'll go ahead and start with you on, and, and Excel Med. Thanks, Daniel. I was hoping you were going to say as a special thanks, let me go last. So I hear what the other guys say. <laughs> but, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, yes, Eric Tansky here, a general partner at Excel Med. Uh, Excel Med is a, is a lower middle market growth private equity fund exclusively focused on the health tech markets, which we define as traditional medical devices, life science tools, diagnostics, digital health, and technology enabled uh, services. Um, this really Excel Med has been in business for about 12 years, started as a, really a venture uh, fund based in Israel and has transitioned to be a US based growth private equity fund. We're now on our second fund, which we recently closed, a $400 million fund, and we are aggressively out deploying capital. You know, in terms of the, the, the market, I think you asked for, uh, you know, Daniel, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, you know, I've been in med tech now first as a banker for almost 20 years. Um, you know, there have certainly been periods of time, you know, especially around the, the Affordable Care Act, say 10, 10 years ago, there was a lot, um, I would say, of uh, change, you know, in the industry. Um, but, you know, even with the pandemic, other than a, a brief uh, pause in M&A activity um, right around the start of the pandemic, things, you know, to me have felt pretty steady. I, I think we are seeing with, I think, the prospect of a lot of uh, potential tax changes, maybe more private, you know, family health businesses, uh, coming to market. But, you know, look, it, it's a sector of innovation. Uh, it's a sector that has a lot of capital regularly coming in. Um, so from, you know, my perspective, it's kind of, you know, in a large extent, same old, same old, um, you know, currently. And be interested to see if my other panelists have a different view. No, it's, it, it's good that you mentioned a couple of those those trends that are kind of driving activity right now. And I think we'll, we'll jump into those uh, a, a little bit more as we continue through the webinar. St Steve, I'll I'll go ahead and turn it over to you uh, and, and Vance Street Capital. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, so Vance Street Capital is a, a lower middle market firm with a very focused approach to investing in med tech and, and life science. And 
we like to use the term highly engineered solutions providers, which to us kind of means, you know, med tech manufacturing, life science manufacturing businesses that are focused on solving really difficult problems for their customers, doing it with speed, excellent quality, and, and really kind of trying, to a certain degree, trying to stay away from the commodity sub-segments of the market. So about 90% of what we do are entrepreneur-owned businesses or corporate carve-outs. And, and that's something where, you know, we, we take an approach here at Vance Street where about half of us are actually former operators. So we we'll really try to think about how we can be more than just a check writer for a lot of these different businesses. So I think with that comes, you know, the need to have a lot of flexibility in terms of how you partner with families and how you partner with entrepreneurs. But you know, I think a lot of the themes that Eric brought up are certainly right. I would say to a certain degree, it's same old, same old, you know, to a different degree. I think we've seen a significant influx of probably newer you know, entrants into this market who've, you know, we were chatting before this kicked off, you know, the, the secret's kind of out to a certain degree. I think people really, you know, are embracing, you know, med tech and life science and, you know, the unique manufacturing environment that, uh, that's you know causing a lot of these businesses to sustain the pandemic a lot better than a lot of other markets. That's a, that's well said. All right, and uh, um, saving saving the best for last, our yeah. home guy Mike uh, in the Massachusetts area. I'll, I'll turn it over to you and, and Riverside Partners. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, you know, Riverside has been around for a little over thirty years actually, and since day one, just focused in two verticals: healthcare and uh, technology. And we, we cast a pretty wide net under, under the healthcare umbrella, you know, everything from uh, devices, diagnostics, contract manufacturing, pharmaceutical services, lab services, uh, tech enabled hospital services. And, uh, you know, we focus majority uh, of founder owned or majority management owned businesses. These are companies that are on a relatively strong uh, growth trajectory, not distressed in any way. We're not turned around guys. Uh, and these are typically companies that are generating revenues that, that yield EBITDA, you know, greater than say uh, five, five million. We're investing out of our sixth fund today and have around a uh, billion dollars uh, under management. Um, uh, from my perspective, I think, you know, the market continues to be very frothy. I think there's a tremendous amount of money on the sidelines. Um, I think we're kind of in this pandemic cycle, if you will, where you know, because of the macro financial situation, <clears throat> there's, you know, government has been spending money to subsidize the economy. I think the cost of money has been historically low. Um, uh, from my standpoint, I mean, that's conducive to larger deals that, uh, that, that we see and the large strategics are, are sitting on uh, cash and, and, and could be losing money if they're doing nothing with it. And, and they're incentivized to use this in, in liquidity to drive, to drive M&A. And I think, as long as the cost of money uh, remains low, we'll uh, we'll see this we'll see this frothy market and valuations. I'm sure my my uh, co-panelists here can can attest to the uh, super high valuations that that we're seeing. Um, and, and when the cost of money rises, maybe the M&A cycle will will slow down again. But um, that's what uh, that we've been experiencing over the past couple of years, at least. Yeah, I've seen that as well in the in the post-COVID area. I think we'll we'll kind of jump back into that in just a second, Mike. Um, maybe before we we kind of get into M and A, you know, maybe each of each one of you could kind of describe what's kind of, what's one of the main current trends in in, in med tech or healthcare that's driving discussion at your company. Um, Steve, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah. I of, of M&A to a certain degree, it's, you know, looking at a lot of different businesses and looking at the impact on COVID on some of these different businesses and really trying to get down to the specific therapies. And I think it becomes even more challenging than that at times. It becomes, you know, how are OEMs or individual OEMs uh, handling their inventory control or purchasing and trying to understand as we look at businesses, um, you know, how impacted have they been or, or haven't they? Um, and then certainly, I think, you know, the theme that everyone hit on here, which is, you know, continued level of activity and, and you know, new, I hit on it earlier, just new entrants into the space, um, you know, from a strategic buyer perspective. But those are certainly, I think, a lot of the themes and trends are about right now at Van Street. Mike, you want to you wanna add anything to that from uh, Riverside's perspective? Yeah, you know, um, for us, uh, we've uh, we, we've been really uh, focused uh, quite a bit on, on on the investments in pharma and biotech, specifically uh, the outsourced services. And and I think this is another record year in in uh, this year. I think there'll be over 
uh, 20 billion in, in VC investments in the in the pharma biotech space. And, you know, think about large molecule cell and gene therapy for you know drugs for oncology, uh, central nervous system disorders, rheumatoid arthritis. And so we're you know, we, we really uh, are uh, like the you know, CRO space and the, and the uh, CDMO uh, subseg subsegments. Yeah, the the uh, the increase in outsourced services has been uh, been a trend that's been driving the uh, driving the industry for quite a few years now. Absolutely. How about uh, er Eric? What, what's uh, what's the current discussion at Excel Med? What what's what are the current trends that you guys are discussing? Yeah, I mean, I'd say a couple of the key themes, uh, Daniel. You know, digital health. Um, you know, we're we're very intrigued there. Uh, you know, the deal activity and the valuations being paid, though it's. It's challenging, you know, as a private equity firm, uh, you know, I would say so. But that's something that we very actively look at. And, you know, the, the data there in terms of the amount of investment uh, that's gone into the sector is just incredible. Um, and, you know, it's not all going to end well. So, it, you know, again, it makes it you're intrigued, um, but it, it looks very risky. And, you know, I'd say the second um, topic most discussed um, at our firm, because a lot of times, you know, we do get very involved in our portfolio companies. You know, I wouldn't call us turnaround guys. You know, we do have thrived at say maybe some challenging situations, and the valuations, you know, in the sector have gotten so high, and you know, sort of everybody thinks <laughs> that you know those valuations translate to their business. And again, you know, it's you know, a lot of discipline uh, in the private equity seat. Um, you know, to not get caught up in that. So I'd say those are some of the key themes that we actively discuss. Uh, that, that, that makes sense in, uh, in, in this year. I think as we've all seen, um, you know, uh, and from either uh, news headlines or just being a part of the industry day to day, I mean, med tech, m &A activity in the med tech sector has significantly increased in the, in the post COVID area, um, or I guess in the COVID areas, we're still kind of in that. Um, you know, I think we, we kind of touched on this in, in some of your introductions. Maybe we'll just come back to this and expand on it a little bit more. What, what do you think is the key driver or, or drivers of the increased activity? And maybe, yeah, I'll go ahead and start with you, Mike. You know, honestly, I, I, I kind of look at uh, my, myself, uh, the, uh, the point of care diagnostic space. I mean, that's something that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I look at the the uh, the deals that are that, that have been that have uh, transpired over the past year the the, the the Thermo Fisher acquisition of Mesa Biotech for example I mean I, I personally love the diagnostic space and and that's an example of you know where molecular diagnostics is really kind of uh, at, at the point of care has has taken hold and COVID has taken this whole subsector to a, 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 an entirely an entirely new level and uh, the advancement of technology, PCR based rapid point of care testing platforms for infectious disease. That's been, that's been a tremendous tailwind uh, uh, based off of, uh, based off of COVID there. No, I, I think COVID's, uh, 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 COVID has impacted a lot of subsectors like, uh, uh, like diagnostics and telehealth to where they've advanced probably uh, what, what normally would take five to 10 years in, in just one to two okay. years time. It's, okay. it's quite impressive. Yeah. Eric, um, how, how about you? What do you think some of the uh, key drivers of increased activity is? Yeah, I think it depends on which sector or segment of the market you're looking at. I mean, certainly you see deals like, you know, Baxter Hillrom and, you know, ICU Smiths. And, you know, to me, a lot of that's driven by very low interest rates, uh, you know, just the cost of money. So I think that's a driver, you know, on the large deal side. I think Mike's point's exactly right. Um, I think it ties to a lot of what's going on on the biotech side with these incredible breakthroughs they have there to treat cancer. You know, the, the you know, cancer diagnostics, call it, you know, theragnostics, um, you know, that was a moribund sector five years ago. And it's really, you know, exploded over the past couple of years with all the advancements, you know, in immuno-oncology. Um, and I do think, you know, again, for the privately owned businesses, the taxes and the prospect there driving a lot of entrepreneurs to look to transact now. So I think you have a lot of drivers. It just depends, I think, in where precisely you're looking because you know if you look at like the venture back the traditional venture backed med tech companies you know that hasn't gotten much better like you don't see too many pre-revenue very early stage commercial you know on that side of the market the acquirers i think want to see real revenue traction and accretive transactions um and so we haven't seen i don't think much improvement 
you know, there. All right, Steve, do you want to add anything as far as the uh, the key drivers of increased activity that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Eric certainly hit it. It's probably a little bit dependent upon what segment of the market you're looking at. And I think for us, advanced REIT, our lens typically ends up being more on the, the med tech side of the equation and typically entrepreneurs. So I think there was, you know, to a certain degree, a pause in activity in Q2, Q3 last year while people were trying to figure out what direction their businesses were going to go in COVID and when they were going to see procedure volumes increase and how that was going to you know, affect their customers' purchasing patterns. And I almost think you then ended up with a kind of a tidal wave of activity that kicked off here this, this year. And then I think on top of that, the overlay of a changing tax landscape for entrepreneurs certainly I think has really caused a, an uptick in volume, at least in the activities that we've seen. But you know, certainly echo what the other two panelists have said here. I think that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think, you know, this next question is kind of a two part question. I think, you know, I, I'd like to know. So do you think that we are in an m and bubble? Simple yes or no. And and then, you know, what what have you seen as far as transaction multiples from from 2020 to 2021? And do you think that will continue into 2022? Um, Eric, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, no, I, I do not believe we're in a bubble. Um, you know, and then in terms, you know, honestly, on, on the valuations, um, I don't know that it's dramatically changed 2020, 2021, uh, you know, I think from my perspective, it, it has to work, you know, for our LPs, I mean, we just, right, each deal is going to be different and we have to make sure for each deal, you know, our entry, uh, multiple makes sense relative to the exit multiple. I mean, case by case basis. Steve, Steve, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I echo Eric. I don't think we're necessarily in a bubble and I think, um, you know, when I look at, at some of the dynamics at play here, whether it's certainly cheap capital, um, an influx of a lot of buyers into this particular space, I think just the macro trends driving a lot of these markets, I don't think we necessarily see significant changes over the next, you know, one to three years. And yeah. I think with multiples, I mean, if I looked at where, where they were, say, two, three, four years ago to where they are now, we've certainly seen a run up. But I'm not sure those are necessarily going to significantly change over the next couple of years. I'm I think our general opinion is that's here to stay. And, and I think we just, you know, speaking for Vance Street, have to remain disciplined and, and really focus on the quality, highly differentiated businesses, which has always kind of been what we've we've tracked after versus, um, you know, those that might be a little bit lower on the complexity spectrum. Now, Mike, do you, uh, do you agree with your fellow panelists there? Yeah, yes, I do, actually. You know, access to capital, cost of capital, you know, all underlying drivers. But, you know, also... Um, you know, I, I see that just a continual trend of the strategics that, you know, rather than um, organic uh, initiatives from a development uh, perspective, they're more on a search and development with, you know, inorganic growth initiatives looking to, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, buy technology and, uh, and, and, you know, execute uh, in that regard. I think it's it perhaps is much more efficient and and especially with accelerated regulatory pathways, that uh, it's a uh, it's it, it's an interesting dynamic that continue that I continue to uh, to see in the space. There you go. I like it when all my panelists agree. <laughs> right. So I'm going to kind of shift to uh, you know talking a little bit about more your firm's positioning and and, and kind of just getting having uh, having the audience get to know kind of what you're focused on a little bit better. So I mean maybe it'd be good for the audience to understand. Um, a little bit more about your firm by understanding a few of the companies you currently have in your portfolio. Um, is Steve, you want to start? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I think advanced as we walk through some of these companies, you'll certainly see a theme. And for us, we really look for highly differentiated niche medical device and life science device manufacturing businesses who, um, you know, are typically number one, two or three in their respective markets. And within that, there's a lot of embedded manufacturing IP process know-how. Um, so a couple of the businesses that we've partnered with in the past couple of years that, you know, some of the, the panelists here might recognize would be Motion Dynamics, which is a, a business that focuses on some of the world's smallest micro wires, coils and springs and entrepreneur owned business founded by Chris Witham over in uh, the western part of Michigan. And Chris has just done a great job of really positioning this business in a lot of the high growth interventional therapies, whether it be uh, neuromodulation or stimulation, a variety of different advanced catheter and guide wire therapies. But a uh, great example of the, the types of businesses that we like to partner with. Um, a similar one would be Applied Plastics. 
uh, applies actually out in, in Boston, Massachusetts, and they do PTFE coated mandrels and coated wires that get, are used in certain cases as a manufacturing aid for advanced catheters. In other cases, they would go into, say, a pouring assembly for a steerable catheter. But you know, similarly, a very differentiated business when you look at the material science and know-how that goes into the PTFE coatings that they have. Uh, another entrepreneur-owned business that we partnered up with uh, with Dave Ring and you know, a third one that uh, we recently partnered with just about a year ago was Ytech Industries. And Ytech makes some of the world's most specialty core wires that would serve as kind of the building block for a specialty guide wire that goes into far reaching areas of your peripheral vascular system or neuro neurovascular system. So, you know, again, for us, partnered up with the Castellino family, um, you know, a great leader in a niche market and, uh, you know, I've had a lot of fun working on kind of building out the foundation of these businesses that have a lot of organic tailwinds, but expanding capabilities, building out the sales channels and, and looking at the org chart as well to continue to bring in talent as certain, uh, you know, key family members might look to, to transition over time. That's helpful. Thanks, Steve. Um, Mike, you want to talk about some of the companies with that Riverside is a part of right now? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, again, founder, uh, founder run uh, type of uh, businesses, uh, um, lots of growth runway associated with uh, uh, with these businesses. I had mentioned pharma services uh, just recently. Uh, we invested in a company called Synergy uh, Pharma Consulting. Uh, uh, they are a, a local company outside of Boston, actually, that focuses on um, uh, chemistry manufacturing and controls uh, services for uh, biopharma and uh, and, uh, and and pharma. Uh, this is more of the you know a, a technical uh, a regulatory compliance type services for early stage uh, uh, single molecule venture back companies all the way to blue chip uh, pharma and uh, biotech. Uh, another company in our portfolio, Innovate Medical. Innovate actually very different uh, company. Uh, it is the, uh, the the leader, the uh, U U.S. leader in. Uh, these are mobile medical workstations, the workstations that uh, tie directly into the electronic healthcare record uh, systems and in, in, uh, in hospitals that um, uh, really facilitate clinical workflow uh, for the nursing staff. Uh, another business is in the hospital, um, uh, tech enabled hospital services business, a company called Revacor, uh, uh, the top player in the US in um, uh, tech enabled revenue cycle management uh, solutions for um, uh, hospitals uh, here, you know, really focused on underpayment uh, collections, denial adjudication, all based off of uh, technology of, uh, you know, uh, uh, thousands of algorithms to uh, collect, uh, identify and collect underpaid claims for hospitals. So that's, you know, especially relevant uh, uh, today in the space. So those are a few uh, from different subsegments that uh, that I'm involved with. All right, thanks, thanks, Mike. Eric, you wanna you wanna wrap us up with some of the companies Excelmed's uh, currently yeah. invested in? Sure. You know, I'd say in general, Daniel, you know, we're looking for companies that have launched commercially, achieved you know some amount of revenue. Our you know criteria, strict criteria, you know, ten million for a growth investment, twenty million LTM for a, a control type investment. And I'd say, you know, a lot of times these companies, they, they were able to get initial commercial traction to cross, cross those thresholds. Then they ran into some kind of challenge um, where top line growth sort of stagnated. Maybe they went out and took debt, you know, kind of complicated the capital structure. And to a large extent, you know, found themselves in a position where they're not able to attract um, you know, the growth capital, uh, you know, many funds are sort of put off, you know, by this too many questions, you know, we've been able to dig in to these companies and then through just a bolus of capital. And, you know, and as I would mentioned, you know, at the outset, a lot of the team, you know, roots go back to being associated with the venture funds that ExcelMed had. So there's a lot of knowledge of what may be out there from a technology perspective that we're then able to bolt, you know, onto the companies and, you know, re-accelerate, you know, top line growth and create value for, for everybody. And, you know, example of that public company was Cogentix, which ExcelMed, you know, acquired, really had been flat top line growth as a public company year over year, not really going anywhere. And ExcelMed came in, made some management changes, 
brought in some additional assets and sold the business uh, 15 months later, a Labory, you know, so I think it was valued in the public markets at 30 million market cap and sold it for 240 million uh, 15 months later. Um, Keystone Dental is another company, you know, which we haven't, you know, exited yet. But again, it's, it's, uh, I think, you know, very illustrative of the type of company we're looking for, you know, about 50 million in revenue, had been private equity owned, you know, a lot of challenges, you know, Selmeb is effectively able to acquire the company. Um, I think that that private equity firm just needed to exit the position. Um, so we were able to, you know, acquire it. And then we've made two significant, you know, M&A uh, deals uh, for the company and, and have really changed the profile of the company. It's back into growth. And, and now we, you know, position the company where, you know, an exit in really three years time uh, at a significantly higher, you know, valuation uh, is achievable for us. And then recently, you know, Excel Med came in. This was kind of a COVID deal where Neuropace, which recently IPO'd, had some debt outstanding. And again, a lot of times, you know, equity doesn't want to get behind debt. We're not afraid of that, right? If the circumstances are right, we're not afraid if the company is, has negative EBITDA, you know, as long as it's not, um, you know, exorbitant burn. And, uh, but we were able to come in, invest in the company and then IPO it um, eight months later. And, and, you know, that's a company that wound up being recapped at, you know, I think the public data is 50 million pre and then IPO'd at a $600 million valuation, you know, eight months later. I mean, those are type situations um, where I think we've, you know, had a lot of value add. All right, that's helpful, Eric. We, we actually just had a question come in that I think fits as we're talking about some of your portfolio companies. And can, can one of you explain the difference between a platform acquisition and a bolt-on? Yeah, Daniel, I'm happy to, to jump in here. I mean, I think for us, sometimes it comes down to the size mandate that we have uh, using Vanstreet as an example. So, you know, in certain cases, we're looking for a platform that might be a minimum of $30 million of enterprise value up to 300. And, and that for us serves as a platform that we'll look to build over time. And, and for us, the focus would be predominantly, you know, finding businesses with great organic tailwinds. But um, you know, I think more often than not, as you think about a bolt-on or an add-on, you know, sometimes it falls below that size threshold. And, and in certain cases, it could be, you know, a team that just wants to be part of a larger organization with a very complementary, in our case, you know, product set capabilities. But I think size to a certain degree sometimes comes down to, and it really is dependent upon, and my other panelists can jump in here, but dependent upon the size and mandate for that particular fund's platforms versus what might serve as a uh, more complementary add-on. Thank, thanks, Steve. Now, I, I think it's it's in the title. You know, uh, you, we're all you're all financial firms, so we all obviously think of capital first. But when, when we're thinking about a company that gets brought into each one of your firms, what do you feel you offer besides capital? Um, Mike, I'll start with you. Yeah, you know, I think. Uh... Uh, you know, for me, I was an operator for 22 years before I, I didn't grow up in private equity. Uh, I've run uh, several medical device and, and diagnostic companies and, and uh, you know, I've been at Riverside for nine years. And if, and if I've learned anything over the past nine years is that these are, these are good companies, you know, whether or not they met us. Um, and really, you know, for us, you know, maybe the founders are at a point where they want to take some liquidity, take some chips off the table, roll some equity with us going forward and take the ride uh, to maybe take the company to levels that they, that they dreamed about. And for us, you know, we go into these investments with a really strong growth thesis. Um, and it, you know, it's the fundamentals are of course, making sure we've got the right people on the bus and working with the founders and, and, and you know, filling gaps in the, in the executive leadership team um, very often, these companies don't have a, um, a real strong BD uh, function, and so we'll, you know, we'll uh, help establish a go-to-market strategy and maybe blow out business development, and uh, maybe depending on the sector, the subsector, you know, um, uh, contribute to insourcing or outsourcing manufacturing, taking a company international, doing what we just talked about, these bolt-on acquisitions, maybe to access new markets, new services, technologies, customers. And at Riverside specifically, you know, I, I was involved with Riverside before I joined while I was running my last company. I was a member of Riverside's healthcare advisory board. And today I chair that group. And it's a group of about a dozen or so 
um, executives from different uh, sectors within, within healthcare that I described, device, diagnostics, ph pharmaceutical services, healthcare IT. And, and, and this isn't just window dressing. These are, these are folks that are you know, intimately involved with, with us and our portfolio companies. They help with diligence, but more importantly, they'll serve as independent board members. They'll help open doors, we'll leverage their connections. Um, to get warm client, prospective client uh, referrals. And that, that has really paid back dividends in, in, in almost every portfolio company that I've, that I've, been, uh, that I've been involved with. And, and, and more importantly, I think, you know, our most important, we, we never pretend that we know a business better than the executive leadership team or the founders know a business. It's really trying to figure out how we can plug in and, and add value to really to really uh, bring that growth thesis to realization at the end of the day. No, that, that, that's helpful, Mike. Thanks for the thanks for the context there, Eric. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Same same question. Yeah, I mean, I would say um, the uh, value add that Mike articulates, you know, from Riverside is very similar to the way you know the team at ExoMed. Um, also approaches it, um, you know, the general partners, managing partners, you know, have extensive Rolodexes. It's always amazing to me how quickly we're able to, you know, just pull from our networks, personal networks, um, you know, top leadership uh, throughout the, you know, the industry, you know, to help us assess, you know, as well as you know, our, our operating partners, um, you know, as well. I, I So I think, you know, a lot of the, the same things that Riverside is, is doing. I, I think one thing that I've seen from Excel Med that's different than a lot of private equity funds is the, the idea of these bolt-ons. Um, you know, the, the challenge I've seen with other funds, and this is just from my, when I was a banker, um, and, you know, I'd see private equity acquire a company, and then they would articulate a strategy of adding, you know, growth technologies on, but you know, where traditional private equity, I think, has a challenge is a lot of the technology companies you want to add are EBITDA negative. And a lot of funds only think about things in terms of EBITDA multiples. And again, going back to our team's venture roots, we just don't approach it, you know, that way. And also, you know, their access to, you know, there's a lot of, I think there's over 500 you know, emerging medical technology companies in Israel. You know, I think we have unique uh, access there as well, just given that's where the roots of the fund began. So identifying those companies, um, a team that brings, I think, more of a venture approach and, and a real need to stimulate growth, you know, through uh, M&A. Um, and again, I think, you know, the uh, the proof is, is in the pudding. I think in all of our portfolio companies, we've done several, you know, M&A deals uh, to help get that growth going. Uh, that's helpful to better understand that that perspective at Excel, Med Eric. Thank you, um, Steve. I'll I'll let you finish with that one. I know you had previously touched on kind of IT and and building out sales support, but but go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean I think um, th this will probably sound very similar to Eric and Mike, but um, you know there's kind of an infinite number of check writers out there these days, and more and more coming in. So I think how you differentiate yourself beyond that certainly an important part. And, and I would say for us you know, focusing predominantly on entrepreneur-owned businesses and management-owned businesses, you know, one of the key themes would be flexibility um, and just really listening to those entrepreneurs and listening to the family members when it comes to what they want out of the transaction, whether it's, you know, a CEO who wants to remain in the role of CEO, but take some chips off the table and, and you know, have a, a bit of estate planning, but a bigger bank account sitting behind them to grow that business into adjacent capabilities or products. Or, you know, in other cases, it could be a founder who wants to, to begin to transition back into the engineering and product development role that they enjoy. So bringing in a management team, but really listening closely to what is the right fit. Because I think, you know, one thing that uh, we're really cognizant of, of advanced is just the culture and who are those important people that built the business. And, and in many cases, these are multi-generational businesses that, you know, the name that hangs out in front of those buildings is incredibly important. So, you know, we're, that's something that we really pride ourselves in is, you know, listening and trying to understand what's important to them. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of different flavors of private equity out there and financial buyers. And, and I think uh, for us, it's really focusing on trying to you know, partner up with the best in class and then listen to how can we help build out the foundations of those businesses. So is it to your point, focusing on sales and what is the right strategy? Is it you know, a sales rep? Is it direct? Is it a hybrid of the two? And looking at how we can try to leverage our network of operating partners to you know, help them achieve some of those goals and objectives better. Um, you know, certainly the quality arena is one that 
you know, with entrepreneur owned businesses, that's maybe not always the most fun to, uh, to focus on, but are there ways that we can help them, whether it's getting, you know, ISO 1340, 1345 certified, is it uh, trying to help them build out the infrastructure to better serve, you know, customer quality audits. Um, so really trying to look through the different foundational areas and figure out how we can help them with our network of operating partners. And, and I think that's kind of ingrained in our DNA with, um, you know, some of our managing partners and partners at the firm having worked and run med tech businesses and life science businesses. Yeah, re really helpful context, guys. I think as we've already talked about, there's there seems to be an endless amount of private equity firms out there these days. So finding a, the right partner that can bring just more, more than just capital to the equation can really make it a big impact after a transaction. I, I'm going to shift to, I think, deal, or, deal origination or how you discover your opportunities. Um, when thinking of deal originations, do, do you see your deals result more as part of a your strategy execution and outreach, or do you typically see more things come in from a business owner or potentially their, their M&A advisor? Um, Eric, I'll start this one with you. Yeah, thanks. No, I, look, it's a, it's a mix for sure. I mean, I would love to say that we sit down and craft, you know, grand strategies and go execute on that. And, but, you know, that's just not the way the world works. And so, you know, it tends to be, it tends to be a mix of, of all of the uh, channels, you know, that you mentioned uh, you know, Daniel and, uh, you know, we, for us, you know, because we're exclusively focused on health tech and because, you know, to our LPs, you know, we've made the commitment, like we're not going to invest in companies, you know, so much of de-risking and health technology is just told through the revenue story. Um, it, you know, it's really, you know, you have to be north of that 10 million LTM revenue for us to consider a growth investment. You know, and that could be a check, you know, 15 to 40 million and then, you know, north of 20 million for the control type in investments. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, we feel like we do have the in-house technical and also the external resources to, to diligence opportunities. And so we, you know, we really tend to not become laser focused on just a particular therapeutic, you know, segment area. It's more about that financial profile for us. Thanks, Eric. I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Steve. Um, you know, when you think about dealerization, where, where do most of your deals come from? Yeah, I would say, you know, we certainly will see an excess of, you know, call it 600 deals a year, but a good number of those, um, you know, are us looking through our network, um, trying to make sure that we're active mapping the markets. And in certain cases, um, you know, our, our existing portfolio companies are great when it comes to making introductions to you know, families and businesses that they think that we might be a good fit to, uh, to partner with. And that is how we've, you know, in certain cases generated activity. But, you know, for us, it's much more of a, you know, deal generation that originates from, you know, those in the firm reaching out and, and getting to know entrepreneurs over time and getting to know, you know, families over time, knowing it's typically going to be a very long courtship, given uh, this is a significant decision for a family, a significant decision for an entrepreneur. And, and getting to know them over a multi-year period becomes pretty important. So it's, you know, planting a lot of seeds and trying to make sure that we're active and identifying what are those, you know, market trends, market themes, manufacturing technologies that have a lot of tailwinds over the next, you know, five to 10 years and, and map those accordingly. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Mike. Yeah. A, a lot of the same, Daniel, you know, we have, uh, uh, we have a partner at Riverside that's just responsible for deal origination. That's all he does. Um, but, uh, you know, we have active internal targeting projects uh, on specific sub segments that you know we have a strong interest in, and um, and so it's uh, you know really trying to establish those those relationships. I think that you know Steve had mentioned that take a, a long period of time and, and that comfort level, and uh, but uh, you know it's a mix for sure. So I know you all see a lot of opportunities come in each year. What do you think is one of the biggest mistakes that you see a seller make when they are trying to exit their business? Um, Steve, I'll start with you. Yeah, good, good question there. Um, yeah, I think the upfront preparation that a seller you know, makes and, and ultimately takes can really lead to a more successful outcome or, you know, lead to maybe a higher risk of, of something coming off the rails in the process. And I think whether that's a sound legal advisor, whether that's spending time, you know, really making sure that your financials are clean, uh, whether it's a quality of earnings up front, right. if there are lingering quality issues or cap is, you know, trying to make sure that, you know, as with anything, the more preparation, the more upfront work that you do um, is typically going to lead to just a cleaner deal, a quicker close. And 
and less surprises as you go through the process. So I think it's really trying to spend that upfront time and, you know, whether that's six months or 12 months, but to, uh, to get the business ready to sell. Yeah, I think ma managing expectations and preparation. Ab absolutely, Steve. Um, Mike, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I agree uh, fully. I mean, you know, really not being prepared for the lift, if you will, but the depth of diligence that's that's required. And, and, and more often than not, if a banker is is running a process on a company, pretty much they're they're um, uh, they have that addressed. But you know, for the for the you know the, the entrepreneurs that we've sourced organically and the businesses, it's uh, it, it 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 can be difficult just kind of navigating through that. And I I personally I find too that you know th those who are you know too aggressive with forecasts with with no line of sight or visibility or the, with a you know, a really tangible pipeline, uh, you know, that uh, um, I think that's a, that's a big mistake. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense, Mike. Thank you. Er Eric? I think everything Steve and Mike said 100% right. I mean, very off-putting to me when sellers put very aggressive forecasts. It's almost insulting, right? I mean, all of our general partners, managing partner, we've all been in the sector for, you know, 20 plus years. We know, you know, what a credible, an attractive top line looks like and, and what a ridiculous, you know, top line uh, set of projections look like. And then, you know, also sellers who are just over the top aggressive on valuation um, right out of the gate, you know, before we even had a time to really sort of, you know, kind of get pregnant with, with the idea. And, you know, the back of my mind, I'm always like, look, if that's the valuation you want, you're probably looking for a strategic buyer, right? Who has a lot of synergy values to deliver to you. Um, and if you're talking to financial buyers, you know, it's just a different calculus, um, you know, in many cases. So, but I think, you know, what Steve and Mike said really is sort of the, uh, you know, the top um, errors that sellers make is don't prepare themselves and things fall apart in due diligence. No, that, that makes sense there. And Eric, I think, you know, bringing up valuation kind of, you know, brings me to my next question. You know, I'm often asked um, from business owners uh, about valuation and what, what are some of the key drivers of valuation at your firm? Um, what are ways businesses can ensure they secure the maximum value? And you, know, you often see a, a huge range of multiples um, for, for, for similar sized companies. Um, you know, Mike, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think with, uh, you know, f for us, you know, we, we, we have a real strong uh, understanding of the different sectors, the subsectors, what multiples are, are typical in, in, those, in, those, uh, in those segments. And, you know, for us, it, it really, uh, we really, you know, try to, try to focus too on, you know, the management, uh, the sustainability of the business, uh, the, 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 the potential growth trajectory of a business, the, 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 the total available market, but also I think as um, Steve had mentioned, uh, being able to look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, downside base case, uh, upside cases of financial modeling and what that means to us at the end of the day in terms of, in terms of cash on cash return and, and IRR modeled out. So I think it's a, there's lots of independent variables, and it depend on it depends on the the segment and the uh, and the sub segment. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Eric. Yeah, for me, I, I guess I always kind of start at the, what you know what market segment are they in, and what what are the growth um, you know prospects for that that sector. Um, that's kind of where you know for me, I start to frame value. You know, if you're in, for instance, you know say cardiac surgery, um, you know, the secular trends there, right? Just doesn't matter how great your technology, you know, et cetera is, that market is shrinking. And, and so that kind of becomes a trap, if you will, you know, on value or cap on value for that seller. And so I start, you know, really uh, from there. And then, it, you know, it becomes sort of your standard due diligence of like, what is the quality of the asset, the quality of the manager team, what's our potential to bring, you know, in uh, additional technology, et cetera, to, you know, get quote unquote, multiple expansion and create value um, at a high level. That's, that's sort of how I start thinking about, you know, evaluation framework. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Steve, how about you? Yeah, I think Mike and Eric really hit a lot of the, the key themes. I mean, I think we take a similar approach to 
you know, what markets or therapies does that particular business have exposure to? And then, you know, I think the overlay of that is, you know, how differentiated are the capabilities, the products, uh, and then how scalable is that business as well? What's the infrastructure that's in place? And then how much investment might need to go into that business to enable them to achieve the growth rates that we might see across those particular therapies. But, you know, I, I think, you know, another overlay is, as you look at the business, is there a certain level of diversification within the customers? Um, you know, I, I think a business that's got 80% of their, you know, their revenue with one customer versus 15% uh, as the largest customer. I think that's typically a, a driver that you'll certainly see. And then, you know, I think that defensibility or, or competitive moat they ultimately have. Um, and sometimes I think that gets almost into what market they're playing in terms of how sticky is that revenue base um, and how differentiated are they versus kind of some of the more commodity like commodity businesses. So certainly a lot of different, I think, factors and levers that, that go into ultimately trying to drive, you know, what that evaluation multiple ends up being. All right. Thank, thanks, Steve. Now, uh, maybe somewhat similar of a question to one I asked just a second ago about common mistakes sellers make, but you know, one, once you've entered into an LOI with a company, what, what are some common issues that sellers face that cause, uh, cause a deal to fall through? Um, Eric, you want to start us with this one? Well, I mean, once we, you know, once we sign an LOI, I mean, there's usually a high degree, you know, of conviction to get a, get a transaction done. You know, I would say, right. We've, we've done a, a fair amount of due diligence, you know, at that, at that point. So, I mean, I, I hate to say, you know, you know, short of just an outright, you know, lie or something like that, or, you know, some kind of material out, you know, adverse event. Um, but, you know, we are really trying to, committed to getting that deal done. So it would have to be something pretty significant, you know, IP, um, you know, some kind of, you know, hole in IP that wasn't uncovered in, in preliminary, you know, due diligence, uh, I guess would be, you know, maybe one of the, the most uh, obvious things, because typically, you know, you're not really digging in on IP until the latter half of due diligence, you know, anyway. Um, so, you know, look, anything, I mean, a variety of things, right, as we all know, can kill a deal ultimately, but from a fun perspective, I mean, we're really focused on getting a deal done once we issue an LOI. Steve, any, anything to add to that? Uh, very similar to Eric. I think we try to do an enormous amount of upfront work so that whatever we put in front of a seller, you know, we can stand behind and ultimately transact at. So, you know, it typically has to be something that's, you know, comes out of left field, whether it's significant environmental issues, you've contaminated groundwater, you know, something to where it's just, you know, wasn't foreseen that creates, you know, such a liability that it, it makes it hard to, to ultimately move ahead. But, you know, I, I think, you know, at a certain level, making sure there's, you know, very regular communication, you know, I, I think, you know, the stories certainly get out between, you know, lawyers batting drafts of a purchase agreement back, you know, 20 times. I think for us, we always say, let's be quick to just over communicate with the seller and, and jump on the phone and, and chat through it, and not let it be a, a game of telephone at any point in time, really over any issue. Yeah, we, we always talk about transparency with our clients and being as transparent as possible up front. And that, that often helps to avoid some of those, uh, some of those issues post LOI. Um, Mike, Mike, any additional thoughts from you? Yeah, yeah they, they, they really, uh, uh, nothing, nothing significant. I mean, we spend a tremendous amount of time getting to that stage. There's, you know, this certainty to close. And, you know, if there's a major Q of E discrepancy that arises or, a, uh, you know, clients walk or, management walks or something like that. I mean, that's the, you know, it would have to be of that magnitude. Now, can you guys describe a, a, a typical deal structure just real quick? How, how does that look from your perspective as far as, I mean, obviously there's gonna be cash involved, but will, will, will a, a seller see milestones, equity, um, financing? Um, how, do you, how do you view that, Steve? Yeah, as far as, you know, speaking on Van Street, you know, we've typically kept it fairly straightforward in terms of, you know, a cash purchase price. You know, we, we haven't really gone down the path of seller debt financing. Um, you know, when it comes to reinvestment, um, you know, we, we typically are one to say, you know, we don't have a hard line where you have to invest 20% or 10% or 30%. And, you know, but just, I think, philosophically for us, forcing someone to invest, um, you know, in a business that, you know, that's their money, that's what we're paying them for. We certainly hope that they like our growth thesis enough to, to want to partner together. But, um, you know, I think we take a pretty flexible approach. And, and you know, I think in certain instances, there could be an earnout um, or a milestone payment, but that's typically when you see, you know, 
some significant revenue event um, that maybe isn't perfectly diligenceable, but there's a high degree of confidence in to try to help bridge a valuation gap. But typically for us, it, it's fairly plain vanilla. So, Mike, how about uh, how about you and Riverside? Yeah, you know, the same here. You know, um, cash. Uh, uh, we have done deals. I've been involved with deals where there's been milestone earnout payments. Uh, I, I, I think every deal that I've been involved with in the past nine years, you know, the founders have rolled some percentage of equity with, not that we've required it, but they've chosen to roll uh, some percentage of equity with us uh, going forward. And Eric, how about you? A very similar approach to Mike and Stephen. I love to see when the uh, existing investors roll equity. I mean, again, you know, we're financial buyers. We can't get to the same valuations often as strategics. And so I, you know, I like to see those folks have, uh, you know, enjoy some of the upside that, you know, I know we're going to create, you know, over time. Um, you know, we've, We've done things, um, you know, like above a certain return, you know, sharing, you know, additional upside, you know, with, uh, you know, with the existing investors. Uh, we want everybody to win, right? And that's the way a, a good deal to me. That, that's the way the definition of a good deal is every, everybody won. Now, so once you once you close a transaction, um, you know, kind of looking at what are expectations for an owner following a transaction? What's a typical role for an owner after you've acquired a company? And, and what does the first 100 days look like um, when, once you've closed the deal and you have a new company in your portfolio? Um, Mike, you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, every case, of course, is different. More often than not, um, the owner wants to continue to run run the business. We had had Kate have had cases where you know, he only wants to transition over time, uh, perhaps, uh, and uh, be, on the, uh, be on the board, take a board role and help us recruit a CEO, or, uh, or I'll, I'll come in as an interim CEO for, for a period of time. Um, but the, you know, the first 100 days, uh, Daniel, honestly, I mean, we strive to have no surprises on either side. And, and before we close, there's a consensus on a 90 day, uh, a 90 day plan. And, 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 you know, most importantly is to get alignment with management. I mean, um, we, you know, we, we ensure that nothing dramatically changes. The people, employees still come to work every day, you know, day to day should not change for the employee base. And we just want to make sure that together we have that foundation to, to execute the growth strategy. So very often the, the companies in which we invest um, we, we find ourselves uh, working with the team to perhaps bring in a, a professional CFO. Um, there's a, you know, there's a heavy lift, as I say, from a financial reporting perspective and getting into that rhythm of reporting, especially if you have debt financing and lenders involved with the, uh, with the company. Uh, we typically get aligned on uh, performance objectives uh, uh, overall for each function of, of a business. And and, and begin to execute uh, the growth strategy. Absolutely, the, the preparation begins before the close. Absolutely, yeah. Mike. Um, Eric, how about you? Yeah, I think, you know, very similar, um, you know, as to what Mike uh, laid out. I mean, I think the point he made about, you know, there should be no surprises, um, right, you know, upon close. And, you know, like I think the, uh, the existing owners should expect us to be very curious. You know, I mean, typically we're investing in as a control, you know, investor. So we want to, you know, understand the asset that we've now acquired, but, you know, we're not operators, right? I mean, I, I spent uh, several years carrying a bag, you know, in the OR uh, as a sales rep, but, you know, I, we're not coming in to run the business. Uh, we want management to do that. We want to, you know, try and be helpful, creating value, thinking about exits and, and, and that sort of thing. So again, from the day-to-day, the -day, they, they shouldn't expect um, any major changes, you know, from what they, they've been doing. You know, hopefully the capital that we bring, um, you know, helps them just turbocharge the activities they already had, you know, ongoing. And then Steve, you want to you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I don't think Mike and Eric have left me a whole lot because they really hit on <laughs> the general uh, themes of playbook. But, you know, I think, um, you know, to, to Mike's point, you know, for us, it's mainly entrepreneurs or families. There is a range of, of desires of the entrepreneurs in terms of remaining as the CEO or transitioning out over a period of time. And I think one of the fun things has been seeing an entrepreneur who said, you know, I'm ready to transition in the next three months. But, you know, once 
you know, admin HR tasks get taken off their plates, you know, all of a sudden, lo and behold, two years later, they're there having a lot of fun and getting back to, I think, what they enjoyed doing in the earlier innings of building that business. So, you know, I think that's one where we certainly always strive for that. And, and you know, to Mike and Eric's point, you know, if we've done our diligence correctly, really limit the surprises and, and begin to, over that 100-day plan, be, uh, you know, think more about growth, hold a strategy session, invite some of the key sales reps, distributors, customers to begin to think about, you know, what, um, what fence we're swinging for in the next three to five years. But, um, yeah, I think Mike and Eric really hit on a lot of the different points for us. All right, had, have, had another one come in from the uh, the audience that I wanted to ensure we got in, um, but we've been talking a lot about sellers exiting to, to to your firms. When do you think about exiting your portfolio of companies, and what's what's the average time um, you're you're invested in a company? I think, uh, Eric, I'll start with you. Yeah, uh, good question. It's it's obviously going to, obviously going to vary. Um, I, you know, I would say across now that the two funds, I mean, we've had, you know, several exits and, you know, it candidly, it's been that, you know, sort of three to five year, uh, window. Um, you know, there's some that have happened faster, um, and there are some that are taking a little bit longer, uh, but because of where we're investing the revenue profile, you know, of these companies and, you know, just where, you know, say the med tech IPO market is or, or what buyers are looking for, you know, we tend to not be that far, um, you know, call it striking distance from an exit, you know, on, on average. Steve, what, a, what about Van Street? Yeah, I would say, you know, similar to Eric, it's kind of one of those, it, it depends, but I think um, for us, and, and this is what we certainly tell our investors is that this segment of the market, typically it's a a longer hold because you don't win a new customer overnight. You don't, you know, break into new therapies or, or new capabilities overnight. And that's one of the things that we certainly like about the med tech market is that it's very sticky. Um, and those customer relationships, you know, get developed over many years. So, you know, I would say, you know, for us, it could be, um, you know, certainly five and well in excess of five years. Um, because, you know, one of, I think the biggest challenges for us is finding great businesses. So once we found them, a great business, a great family, a great team. Um, you know, we want to try to obviously continue to grow and partner and, and our investors understand that on our end. Thanks, Steve. Um, how, how about you, Mike? Yeah, I think in the 32 years Riverside has been in existence, we've exited once in less than four years. And that was just because of a crazy offer that came over the transom that the founder said was crazy not to take. So um, we're more longer term, Discipline, patient investors, uh, typically, you know, four to six years, sometimes eight years, just depending on, you know, executing that that strategy um, and, and ensuring that uh, um, that uh, you know we've we've done what we said we were going to do. All right. Well, I see Brian's jumped back on the screen. So before he uh, takes back over, I just want to say a special thanks to, to Steve, Mike, and Eric for joining me today for this webinar and being participants in this panel, as, as well as a special thanks to the audience for, uh, for attending today and taking time out of your schedules for, for, for this event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Steve, Mike, and Eric for your excellent information. I think uh, everyone that attended today and everyone that's going to watch this video is going to learn a ton about this process. It's an exciting time in med tech. It's an exciting, it's always been a, a field that uh, is fascinating when it comes to exits and liquidity events. It's great to see uh, three terrific firms that are involved in that and hear your perspectives. Well, that concludes uh, med tech M&A from the buyer's perspective. I want to thank MedWorld Advisors for your support as always. And I want to thank everyone who attended today for uh, joining us and taking some time out of your, out of your day. I uh, will look forward to seeing you all again at our next program. And if you are in Boston next week, please uh, register for the Biomed Device Conference and come check out our MedTech Showcase and Startup Stadium. We're going to have a ton of live in-person programming uh, all about featuring startups with, and also discussions with strategics and then also a great discussion um, in the afternoon on manufacturing and the lessons we've learned so far in COVID. So thank you so much everyone and have a great rest of your day.